flesh, that he came down from heaven, that he came, died as a criminal on a cross, not because he was a criminal, but because I was. Not because he was a sinner, but because I was. And he came and he died a criminal's death and died in my place. Hey guys, it's David here again, and I am so honored to get the privilege to make this another video for you guys. Uh, I do want to remind you guys that we are still going through the Be Encouraged booklet. I have been super blessed by this. I've been super encouraged by the ways you guys have been taking advantage of this book and you know using the words and, and, and journaling it and writing out, uh, soaping, inspecting, and studying the word for yourself. I've been super blessed by that. I hope you guys have been blessed as well. Um, this is our final week going through the booklet. We are closing it off in Titus. It is one of my favorite books and, and a very powerful book and with a lot of deep truths in it. It's a very small book. It's only three chapters. So just Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Um, and I'll be doing a teaching on that uh, for the web show Wednesdays and also for the... Uh, next week's Sunday sermon and I'm really looking forward to it so um, be sure to check those out and just such a powerful um, book and, and letter from the Apostle Paul so this week um, I wanted to share with you guys we're closing out 2nd Timothy right this was the last our uh, Friday was the last day we were supposed to be reading 2 Timothy, if that's news to you, or 2 Timothy chapter 4, if that's news to you, uh, you can use the weekend to catch up. It's super easy. It's a great time to catch up this week uh, before we start our next series uh, in two Sundays from now, or in two weeks from now. So um, I'm really looking forward to that. Also, big shout out to all those great moms out there for uh, giving ba making babies and making the best fifth and sixth grade ministry that I've had this year so um, out of all the fifth and sixth grade ministries I've had this year you guys are the best and that is because of your mom so give her some love give her all the kisses that you have and um, you know really show her that you appreciate her because I'm sure it's been extra challenging for her especially during this time so stop being a pain in the butt love your mom and uh, Thank you. <laughs> awesome. So, Second uh, Timothy chapter four is what we're going to be covering today. Um, and so, uh, I I titled today's message, "I Forgot My Jacket." And it kind of interesting the way this fits with like Mother's Day because who do you call when you can't find something? Your mom. For some reason, moms just have the supernatural ability of you can look somewhere a hundred times and look in the same drawer. You're like, I can't find it. Your mom walks up, she pulls it out. It's just. It's amazing. But anyways, you're like, ah, oh, man, or, or um, for me personally, a big thing that I do all the time is that I forget my, uh, who knows what, it could be a book, it could be uh, my laptop even, it could be a jacket. I've actually called my stepdad one time from church, be like, hey, are you coming to, are you coming to church? Or are you coming to Oceanside? Because I forgot my jacket and it's kind of cold. And he didn't bring it. And so that's okay, because it was my fault for forgetting the jacket. And so the reason I titled it, um, I Forgot My Jacket, is because this is a letter from Paul, and he's writing to Timothy, and it's a really personal letter. Like, we need to remember as we're reading this, this isn't just a book that God wrote to speak to us, but this was first, before it was um, the Word of God, you know, in the Bible, um, it was a, a personal letter written by a man to his disciple, and so we need to keep that in mind. So I want to read with you guys now 2 Timothy chapter 4, uh, verses 1 through 22. Verse 1, it says, I solemnly urge you in the presence of God in Christ Jesus, who will someday judge the living and the dead when he comes to set up his kingdom. Preach the word of God. Be prepared whether the time is favorable or not. Patiently correct, rebuke, and encourage your people with good teaching. For the time is coming. When people will no longer listen to sound, wholesome teaching, they will follow their own desires and they will look for teachers who will tell them whatever is itching, whatever their itching ear wants to hear. They will reject the truth and chase after myths. Verse 5, but you will keep a clear mind so that in every situation, don't be afraid of suffering for the Lord's work uh, work at telling others the good news and fully carry out the ministry God has given you. As for me, my life has already been poured out as an offering to God. The time of my death is near and I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race and I have remained 
faithful, and now the prize awaits me, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on the day of his return. The prize is not just for me, but for all who eagerly look forward to his appearing. Timothy, please come as soon as you can. Demas has deserted me because he loves the things of this life has and has gone to Thessalonica. Cretan has gone to Galatia. Titus has gone to uh, Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Bring Mark with you when you come, for he will help. He will be helpful to me in my ministry. I sent Tychicus uh, to Ephesians, Ephesus. Uh, when you come, be sure to bring the coat I left with Carpus in Traos. Uh, also, bring my books and especially my papers. Uh, that's a the scriptures that he has. Um, verse 16. Uh, the first time I was brought before the judge, no one came with me. Everyone abandoned me. May it not be counted against them. But the Lord stood with me and gave me strength so that I might preach the good news in its entirety to all the Gentiles to hear. And he rescued me from certain death. Yes, the Lord who delivered me from every single, every evil attack will bring me safely into the heavenly kingdom. All glory to God forever and ever. Amen. Verse 19. Give my greetings to Priscilla and Aquila and those living in the household of Onosophorus. Heratus uh, stayed in at Corinth and I, I left Trophimus sick in Maltus. Do your best to get here before winter. Ubala sends you his greetings. So do Putin's, Linus, Claudia, and all the other brothers and sisters. May the Lord be with your spirit, and may his grace be with all of you. Amen. So we see right here, Paul just has see, such a um, powerful letter. And so this is actually Paul's, this is the last letter that we have written from Paul in the entire Bible. Uh, this is the letter that he wrote on his way uh uh, close to the ends of his death in Rome uh, as he was executed there. And so it's really uh, and important that we pay attention because not only is this his last letter and this his last, the last recorded words that we have of Paul, but this is also uh, the way he speaks about this letter and the things he has to say. He says it with such an urgency. See, it's marked when he says, I, in the first line of, of chapter four, he says, I solemnly urge you in the presence of God in Christ Jesus. I solemnly urge you this, this sense of urgency, this importance that he has to say. So these things that Paul wants to speak to us, they're, they're important. They're things that we need to make note of and make sure that we're applying to our lives and living uh, the way that God calls us to live. And so, uh, so, so this strong language marks an importance and we should be paying attention to what Paul wants to say. See Paul is can see then Paul continues to teach Timothy. Remember Timothy is a young teacher um, and he was uh, teaching the Word of God regularly. He was a young preacher. He was a pastor of a church and so uh, he, he was commanding Timothy to share the Word of God and to be ready even when it's the, not the best time. He's saying and, and this is a scripture that always speaks to me and I encourage you guys as well. He's saying Always be equipped and ready with the word of God that I have spoken to you, that, that God has given you, because you never know when someone's going to need to hear it. And it's, it's so much better to be equipped and ready and know the word of God and, and read the word of God and let the word of God speak to you so that first off, you get that word for today and it, it blesses you, but also that if you encounter someone who needs Jesus and God tells you, share my love with them, you are equipped with the words that God has said to you. And so that's why he says, be prepared even when it's not the best time, even when the timing is unfortunate, even if you're kind of busy he says no be prepared because it's it's so much better to be prepared and be able to speak into someone's life right he's all we're always supposed to be equipped with god's word see he then continues on with more instructions for uh timothy for when he's teaching the word of god he says when you teach the word of god he says patiently correct rebuke and encourage your people with good teaching 
right? There's three different things that he points out here. There's um, a correction. He says, okay, make sure there's correction, make sure there's rebuke, and make sure there's encouragement. So I was thinking about this and I was meditating and, I, and I've been so blessed by these because of the personal direct application I can pour out in my teachings towards you guys. But I was thinking for you, what, what would this mean from the other side of the screen, from the other side of the camera, if you will, right? He's saying, okay, a good teaching, this is what a good teaching does. A good teaching has correction. A good teaching has uh, a rebuke and a good teaching has a, and or an encouragement and so what I want you guys to make a note of is when you're listening to a study and it's it's so easy to turn on gold play on your phone get distracted no but what we're supposed to s search for when we're gathering together when we're watching these sermons when we're you know and when we're back in the church and we're gathered together and we're watching and we're uh, paying attention to sermons we're supposed to look for is God trying to correct us in something see uh, we are to expect correction, rebuke, and encouragement in sermons. This is something to expect. Your Bible teacher, uh, me, Pastor Dan, Pastor RJ, for you sixth graders moving up uh, soon, right? He says, first off, there's correction. See, correction is, is pretty simple. It's just, is there something that you believed that is wrong? Is there something that you were thinking um, that, that needs to be changed? Or is there something that you're doing that is wrong, that isn't honoring God, that needs to be changed? And, and does that need to be pointed out to you? See, uh, an example of this is some people like to compare the Holy Spirit like and think it's like the Force in Star Wars. Um, I'm sorry, but no. Right? In the Force in Star Wars, the Jedi is using to manipulate right, and, and push things around. But no, that's not how the Holy Spirit works. No, the Holy Spirit is a person that we have a relationship with. And He uses us as His vessels to do His work. And He empowers us and gives us strength. But He's not this force around all living creatures that allow us to manipulate the situation around us. No, we are the vessels in this situation. Right? That's a, that's a correction that we need. Right? Another one is a rebuke. Is there something in your life that you're specifically doing wrong? That Not that something that you've done wrong and you need to be corrected on, but something that you've done wrong or you're doing wrong that you know is wrong. Right, That's called trespassing. When you know you're not supposed to go, then you go, right, that trespass against God. Do you need to be rebuked? Does that need to be pointed out to you? God so often through teachers, through his appointed pastors is appointed Bible teachers who, by the way, on the other side, receive a stricter judgment, right? These are the things that you're supposed to expect from them, right? If it's brought up in a sermon, that's God trying to get your attention to rebuke you and say, stop, repent of your sin and draw close to Christ. And the last one is encouragement, right? Have you been down? Have you been distracted by the coronavirus and, and it's stopping you from pressing into God and seeking after Him? Uh, you were reading more in the beginning, but then you've stopped. Um, is there things that were you just distracted from the Word of God or you've been, you've been discouraged because you haven't got to see your friends, you haven't got to see other believers, and, and it's been hard just being stuck at home? Are you discouraged? And do you need to be lifted up and reminded like God is still with you? Do you need to be reminded that Christ still loves you, that your friend still loves you, that I still love you, and that this is just the season for now, and that we don't have the promise that we'll gather together again, but we do have a promise of eternity. We do promise that we have a God who loves us, who takes care of us, and is and is um, watchful for us, right? That's a, an encouragement. And these are things, right? We are to expect correction, rebuke, and encouragement in sermons. Don't, it's so easy to drift off and pay attention like it's another podcast. But no, this is a, an appointed teacher by God to speak to your life and where you are now, right? God has put me in this situation for this time. God has put you in this situation for this time. So be prepared and expect God to use the Bible teachers in your life, right? Because he, he, he contrasts this with another kind of teaching, right? He says there's this kind of teaching where someone is, is this ear is itching and, 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 a, and a pastor or a teacher can come up and they tickle people's ear, right? This is um, a kind of teaching that doesn't have expectate, uh, doesn't have a uh, correction or rebuke, but it, it just has encouragement, right? These there's some teachers out there, and they're just like, "Oh, God wants you to be happy, and He loves you, and he, He's so He's so loving and kind, and God wants to bless you with so many gifts." And and you, and you walk away, and you're like, "Wow, I feel really good about myself," right? But 
that they're missed. That's not a good teaching because a good teaching has correction, rebuke, and and encouragement. All three are very important. And so, you know, some teachers and and that's called tickling the ear. And some people they have that and they're like, you know what, that made me feel good. See, but God's word, those teachers. They're not using God's word to sanctify you, which means to make you more like Jesus, to make you um, more like the Savior, to make you more like God, to make you more godly. No, these are teachers who are just trying to make you feel nice. And it's not wrong to feel good and to feel encouraged. Those are great gifts and amazing. But we're not supposed to respond to the tickling of the ear. See, you want to know how you're supposed to respond to this tickling of the ear? Let me show you what my stepdad did. You know, he let me tickle his ear for a little bit, which I was really surprised about. But then when he noticed what I was doing, he's like, you need to stop. Right? He was ready to hit me. Later, he even grabbed his pen. He wasn't going to hurt me, but he was just being funny because that's that's how we do. We love each other. And so, um, no, no, we're not supposed to just receive the tickle of the ear and, and let people who always say nice things and encourage us and, and be comforted by that. But no, we're supposed to be challenged and, and corrected and, and rebuked so that we can be molded and shaped it into who God wants us to be. That's what a good Bible study does. That's what a good, that's what a, a good Bible teacher does. Don't fall into the trap of feeling, oh, I, I feel, I feel encouraged by this teacher. He makes me feel nice. No, that's not what the Bible does. The Bible is to make you holy. Only God, he makes you holy, right? Don't listen and give in to the tickling of the ear. See, Paul then gives further instructions about sharing the gospel. And he says to do the work of the evangelist. And in this translation, he says, work hard. Oh, I want to find it because I don't want to say it wrong. He says, sorry, work at telling others the good news and fully carry out the ministry God has given you. He says, work at giving people the good news. He says, put effort into getting the gospel to other people. See, in another translation, I like the way it puts it. It says, do the work of an evangelist. Because not everyone's called to be an evangelist. Not everyone's called to be the great... A uh, great glory who shares the gospel with multiple people and thousands of people gave their life. Or the great... Um, uh, Billy Graham, right? No, we're not all called with that, and we're not all equipped with that gifting, but we are all called to do the work of an evangelist. We are all called to share the gospel. We are all called to tell people about Jesus. We are all called to have that love and that relationship that we have for Jesus and not keep it to ourselves and not be selfish Christians, but to give that to other people, to put work into being an evangelist. Right? This is something that really convicted me. So often I focus on my ministry and you guys that I don't share the gospel. So that's something I'm personally struggling with and challenging myself as well. We need to be corrected and rebuked as we continue on. Right? We need to be focused more on the kingdom of God than the own, than more than just our own ministry sometimes. See, Paul recognized that he was going to die soon. He's talking about this. And he, he says this, these strong words. He says, yeah, my time has come. He says, but I have run the race and I have finished the race strong. I'm actually, yeah, I finished the race strong. See, this is such a, a, a an amazing thing because Paul's saying, I did it. I have done it. I lived this life for Christ. He, he recognized that he was a sinner before. He's like, I have lived this life for Christ. I have given my all for Jesus and I have finished. I'm coming to the end of my life and I have finished the race strong. Oh, I pray that that is the aim in each of every single one of you guys is that one day that you can look back at your life and you say, I finished the race. Because when we look at this and Paul, he wrote about all, we're going to look later. There's a lot of people who didn't finish the way Paul did. Right? And so, he says, I have. And so how do we do that? How do we look back at our lives one day and say, I finished the race strong. See, we live life 
with the same determination you have when you run a race. Think about it. When you run a race, you're running for something. You're running to win. You're putting your best effort. Even if you know you're not going to win, you still do the best you can to get as close as you can to the front of the line. Because why? What does the winner get? I remember when I was a kid, we'd race all the time. Why? Because I'm the fastest. we get bragging rights and we'd be so excited and be like, man, I'm faster than all of you. I'm the fastest kid in this school. And we'd have these races, right? But whether we're racing for, you know, bragging rights in fifth grade or whether we're, we're racing for an Olympian gold medal, see, those things are temporary. I am no, actually, I never was the fastest kid in fifth grade and I, never will I be, but that bragging, whoever was, I think it was Chance. I guarantee you he's not bragging about that. Now, that's a temporary thing. And even that gold medal that's hung around an Olympian's neck, that's temporary. See, in in Roman's time, in, in Paul's time, they would actually not even get a medal, a gold medal. They would get a leaf crown that would go on their head, and then it'd last a few years, and then it'd crumble and blow away in the wind, because that's what leaves do. But he says, no, I have finished the race, and the prize, he says, and he says in verse 8, And now the prize awaits me, the crown of righteousness with the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on the day of his return. God has promised us a crown. So if we are run and put all of our effort, and we run with such determination for a temporary crown, for something that just crumbles and blows in the wind, for something as trivial as bragging rights, how much effort and determination should we put when we run for Christ, when we run with determination for a medal for reward that will never end, the crown of righteousness. See, um, see, uh, and, and that's the, the, the truth, and that's the way Paul lived, and he says it's possible to be done, but again, it's just like running a race. You set your mind of where you want to go. You set your mind and your mark on the finish line. You set your focus on the kingdom of God and where you want to be. And then you realize that you will receive that crown of righteousness. And you run and you work hard. You might stumble. You might trip. But you constantly go towards the finish line. You constantly work towards the kingdom. That is what a runner does. That is what a disciple of Jesus does. See, now Paul in his letter, he gets a lot more personal. See, he starts talking about his own feelings. See, because even the great and mighty Apostle Paul can relate to you guys in the sense of feeling alone, feeling abandoned, feeling left out, feeling disappointed that he can't see his friends, that he can't see other people. See, he talks about, um, he, he talks to Paul, or he's writing to, to Timothy, and he's saying, please come visit me. I miss you. And I kind of like want to write a letter to all you guys and be like, I miss you. <laughs> Consider this my letter. I miss you. So he's saying, I miss you. And so he's like, I am all by myself. He's like, my homie Luke is still here. It's a doctor who helped him because Paul had a lot of issues. And so, right. Uh, and so he asked him to come see him and he's been feeling alone. He talks about this guy, Demas, right? Who, who Paul mentioned as a fellow servant and a um, and he says that this guy, he, he was a servant. He was a servant of the Lord. He was following Christ. But then he followed the things of this world and left Paul by himself. He went to go Thessalonica and go party and, and do whatever crazy things they're doing. So he decided to go live in sin than to live and run the race towards Christ with Paul. Um, he talks about how he sent Titus, uh, Caesarine, and Titica to Tachius, Tachius, um, he sent them to different locations so that they could be ministers to other people. So the useful people that he wanted around him, they were needed other places. And he's like, dang, I'm all alone. Still, Paul, Luke's still kicking it with him. See, and then I love, I love verse 13. This, this point, this is where the whole title of the sermon came from. Verse 13, Paul says, when you come, be sure to bring the coat I left with Carpus and Treos. Also bring my books and especially my papers. He's literally saying here, I left my jacket. Can you bring it to me, please? Like, I love it because even Pastor Dan, he says, there's humor in the Bible when you look for it or when you find it. And that's one of those things where Paul, we realize, like, Paul's a, a dude riding to his disciple, but like, dang it, I forgot my jacket. But since you're coming, right, it's, it, it's to me. I think it's so funny, right? He he continues to talk on. Uh, he continues to talk, and he, he's um, 
he, he talks about this guy Alexander, this coppersmith. Uh, you, you could try to say blacksmith. He worked with different metals. He was just probably a strong dude. And he was a guy who was another disciple of Jesus. He was someone who um, probably heard Paul and heard Paul's teaching and decided to follow Christ. And, and then Paul, in, in 1 Timothy 1.20, he talks about how Alexander, he was someone who fell away from the faith and whose faith was shipwrecked. And so now Paul is talking to him and he's like, this guy is fighting against me. So Alexander, he was in court with Paul, and he was accusing Paul of a bunch of different crimes. He was accusing Paul of cannibalism. Uh, he was accusing Paul of atheism. He was accusing Paul of all these different crimes to try to get him arrested. And they got this huge crowd, and he, t and Paul standing before a judge. And so uh, Paul, he's he just got done with the situation, right? He had to stand before a powerful, mighty judge who can determine whether he lives or dies. He has one of his old friends accusing him of terrible crimes that he is innocent of. He is, he's standing there and he feels alone, right? For someone who, who was once a brother in life accusing him in, in a room full of people there to watch him get killed, who are there for their entertainment was to see if he would get arrested and then get thrown into the Colosseum and be eaten by lions or killed by another gla or killed by a gladiator. That's what they wanted. They were there to watch him die. And so Paul, he, he's, he, he's in this situation and imagine the feelings. You think you feel alone now. Imagine how Paul felt. Not only was he alone and no one was on his side, everyone else was against him. See, but Paul, he, he realized something. He realized the truth that we all need to remember, especially in this time of isolation. And that truth is that you need to remember that God is with you. Remember, God is with you is with you. See, Paul, he tells this story that I was alone. I was isolated. I was by myself. He, he might have even been scared, but he said, no, because God, the power of God came upon me and I was able to share the gospel in its entirety to every single Gentile in that room, every single person who was against me, every single person who was on my side and then betrayed me and turned my back and is probably against you as well. He says, I got to share the gospel in the entirety. He says, I got to share how they are sinners and that I am a sinner, that I was the chief of sinners and that Christ, he came and appeared himself to me, revealing to me that he was God in flesh, that he came down from heaven, that he came, died as a criminal on a cross, not because he was a criminal, but because I was. Not because he was a sinner, but because I was. And he came and he died a criminal's death and died in my place. Not only did he die in my place and put my sins to death, he also rose again, giving me that same life-giving power, giving me eternal life. And every single person who was there to seek and watch a man be killed and to watch a man be trialed, they went thinking that they were going to hear a man who was going to die for their entertainment. But instead, they heard about a man who died for their sins, who died for their soul. They loved to see blood, but it was the blood that was poured out which loved them so that they could have eternal life as well. See, God had a different plan in Paul's life, and Paul knew that because Paul remembered that God was with him. See, I want to read you guys verse 18 now. He says, Yes, and the Lord will deliver me from every evil act, uh, attack and will bring me safely into the heavenly kingdom. All glory to God forever and ever. Amen. See, Paul realizes, he goes, you know what? I've been shipwrecked three times. I've been stoned to death and God rose me again. He says, I've had people die and rise again. I've had people fall asleep in my teachings and die. He says, I've been through so many things. I've been put on trials and put before kings in so many different times. And every single time, the Lord has delivered me. Every single time, the Lord has been faithful and has saved me. And Paul, he remembered that. And he goes... Paul is, God is the one who's going to deliver me until he doesn't. See, Paul had this recognition that things might not get better. Things might not be okay here on earth. But he was okay because he was in God's hands. He was okay because God was going to deliver him safely into heaven. Deliver him safely into the heavenly kingdom. And he gave all glory to God. That's such a powerful realization. So often we go into difficult situations hoping to get out of them, 
he went into this difficult situation kind of expecting not to get out of it, kind of expecting to die. And it's so interesting, he says, deliver him safely. Paul was martyred and brutally killed for his faith in Christ. But in his eyes, he, he knew he was in the hands of God, that he was safe, he was protected, he was delivered from this life of suffering that he lived. And he was delivered into the promise of eternity that he was promised by the blood of Jesus, by the gospel that he shared with them. And that's the same attitude that we need to have. If Paul can go through judgment being alone and isolated, we can go through this season knowing that God has us in his hands, that God is in control, and that God is going to deliver us safely into heaven. We will get through this situation, whether in this life or the next. And that's the reality, and that's the way that Paul lived. See, when we're truly running this race, we're focused on the finish. Sure, the things around us, they distract us, and they're annoying, but what is important? The finish line. Fifth and sixth graders, disciples of Christ, I encourage you, focus your sights on the things of Christ. Focus your sights on on God and what he wants to do and focus your sights on the kingdom of heaven and the reward of the eternal crowd clap crown that God has for you run the race with the same determination run live life with the same determination as you would run a race see that's the encouragement that Paul has for Timothy here and that's the encouragement that I want to leave with you guys so I hope you guys have a blessed week and it's prayer today so 9 to 12, I'll be at CCO. If you want to come say hi and get some prayer, I'd love to pray for you. Sorry, that's like a total mood change, but I just got really excited because I realized I might be, get to see some of you guys. Love you guys, and um, hopefully I'll get to see you today. Happy Mother's Day. Bye. Don't forget to like and subscribe and hit that notification bell to be up to date on all our new videos. Thank you. God bless.